Welcome everybody to Decolonial Feminist Thought, the second event of our perspectives on racialization, gender, and feminist methodologies um, lecture series at the Sarah Parker Riemann Center for the Study of Racism and Racialization here at UCL. My name is Gala Rexa. I'm postdoctoral research fellow at the SPRC, and I'm delighted to host our two amazing speakers tonight, Professor Françoise Vergès and Dr. Edna Bonhomme. Um, they will be in conversation about decolonial feminist thought in and through their own work. I would also like to um, thank all of you for your interest and for joining us in this fully booked event, uh, which I think is only testament to how timely the themes of our seminar series are and um, to the amazing work of our contributors tonight. So a month ago, we started this series with a conversation between Dr. Zhang Yao and Lola Alufemi, who talked about um, race, affect, and gender. And we're currently working on um, getting two podcasts out of this conversation. So if you didn't make it or if you want to listen to it again, there will be stuff um, out soon. I also already got the chance to talk to Françoise Vergès in the morning, so there will be a podcast um, with her as well. And I also hope to be able to speak uh, to Edna once her book on confinement and epidemics is out next year. Um, so there will be many ways um, to engage after this conversation. And one of them, which has nothing to do with reading or listening, is also uh, the reception that we're going to have after this event at 8 p.m. Uh, it's at the IAS Common Ground, which is two floors from here, but feels like four floors from here. Just uh, follow me or any other UCL people, and please, you're warmly invited. When I was a student, I was always too shy to attend these kind of events, so please uh, join us and don't be shy and feel free to talk to us. Um, so before I'll introduce you to uh, the work of our two amazing speakers tonight, I would like to thank Kaisa Karu, who has been an immense help in organizing um, this event series. She's not in the room with us right now, um, but I still want to acknowledge her. You saw her outside. Um, and also beyond um, helping me organize this, she was also, her kindness and care really helped me to ease in um, here at UCL and to arrive in a new country and new academic system. I would also like to thank um, Paige Patchin for her support in conceptualize, conceptualizing this series, as well as um, Luke de Nerona, Tariq Jazil, Nicola Miller, and Paul Gilroy for their encouragement and for offering the much needed time and infrastructure to organize a series like this. And now, please let me introduce um, our amazing speakers tonight. So we have Professor uh, Françoise Vergès, who's a franco rayonnese uh, activist who has written on decolonial anti-racist feminism, slavery as a regime of extraction, ra the racial capital scene, and anti-imperialism. She also curates exhibitions and decolonial workshops and performances with artists, refugees, and activists of color. The most recent one was at the Berlin Biennale. And her uh, most recent books uh, uh, published in English were A Feminist Theory of Violence, The Wombs of Women, Race, Capital, and Feminism, and A Decolonial Feminism. And as you probably saw when you entered um, this lecture hall, Pluto Press is here to sell some of the books, and they will also be with us during the reception if you didn't get a chance yet. Dr. Edna Bonhomme is a historian of science, editor, and cultural writer. One of her tasks is to mine through the archives and complicate our understanding of contagion, epidemics, toxicity, and maladies. Her essays have appeared in Al Jazeera, The Guardian, The London Review of Book, The Nation, and elsewhere. Edna earned her PhD in the history of science from Princeton University Press and is currently writing her book, Captive Contagions, which examines the role that confinement has played in fostering and hindering epidemics. And I just want to note that our next session and the last one of this lecture series is going to be a workshop on black feminist thought and um, reproductive justice. And Edna has published uh, an article in The Guardian which talks about infertility and reproductive justice. So if you're interested in that, also go check out her work. 
And now I'm as excited as you are uh, to listen to these two amazing thinkers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One thing I'm, I wanted to kind of say is just I'm very uh, grateful to be sitting next to such a prolific writer, feminist, and anti-colonial scholar, uh, especially one who has uh, centered the working class and, and specifically racialized uh, feminists uh, in, in her work. And I guess before we started, start, I wanted to read an excerpt from your book and um, kind of engage with that a little bit, if that's okay. So this is from the A Decolonial Feminism and uh, from the beginning. In January 2018, racialized women who worked at the Gare du Nord railway station won a 45-day strike against their employer. The cleaning company Onet, the subcontractor for the SNCF, these workers who are part of a racialized and overwhelmingly female workforce labor in so-called unskilled industries. They therefore work for low wages under conditions dangerous to their health and most often on a part-time early morning or graveyard shift basis. When offices, hospitals, universities, shopping malls, airports, and train stations are empty. And after hotel customers have left, billions of women take care of cleaning the world every day tirelessly, tirelessly without their work, millions of employees and agents of capital the state, the army, the cultural, artistic, and scientific institutions could not use their offices, eat in their cafeterias, hold their meetings, or make their decisions in spaces where wastebaskets, tables, chairs, armchairs, floors, toilets, and restaurants have been cleaned and made available to them. This work, indispensable to the functioning of any society, must remain invisible. We must not be aware that the world we move through in is cleaned by racialized and overexploited women. On the one hand, this work has been considered what women must do without complaint for centuries. Women's caring and cleaning work is free labor. But on the other hand, capitalism inevitably creates invisible work and disposable lives. The cleaning industry is an industry that is dangerous to one's health everywhere and for everyone who works in it. It is on these precarious lives, these endangered lives, these worn out bodies, that the comfortable life of the middle class and the world of the powerfully ultimately rest. And um, part of the reason I wanted to begin with that excerpt as a kind of pivot is uh, mostly biographical. The women uh, in my family, many of whom migrated from the Caribbean to the United States, one of the very first jobs that they could do um, because of anti-black racism, sexism, and classism was cleaning. And um, in many cases, what you're pointing to is that rather than um, sit with the exploitation that was very much alive and real in the French context, these women decided to collectivize their work, withhold it, and then they won. And I wanted to ask you, why did you decide to begin with that as a kind of point of foot focus when so often labor movements in the French context focus on white male workers who um, are part of the trade union movement? Well, <coughs> okay. <coughs> oh, good. Uh, thank you, good evening already. And thank you uh, for being with me in this conversation. Um, the question of cleaning is absolutely important for me. It's important because, as you say, I mean, what I wrote, no society will function without the cleaning. Mm -hmm. None. There will be, uh, we, we notice when you have struck, you know, men picking up the garbage, but we don't notice the fact that, you know, this room, we will not be able to enter it, to have this conversation as now, if it had not been clean. And so the, the fact that this, as you, you know, as I wrote, rests on the back of black and brown women were totally exploited. And so I wanted also to raise that question, not within the white feminists, like let's share the, you know, like why are the men not doing the laundry or the cooking or taking care or taking garbage out, but showing the foundation of the, you know, capitalist bourgeois society. Mm. Without, and so cleaning is not domestic work. It's not, it's not just within the home. It's not about domesticity. It's about the essential pillar of capitalism. But it has to be done by women, black and brown women. It has to be invisible. It has to be exploited. And it has to be 
you know, absolutely this woman being made precarious. So I wanted to start with that because also, as I say, when the strike was uh, victorious in France, and of course we have had other strikes like that in the United States or in mm -hmm. Brazil or whatever, but what was important, it was, it, it was practically barely noticed in the media because what was important was the letter of white uh, women talking about the right to be a race in the street. You know, it was a, a reaction against Me Too. Mm. So Me Too will not allow, you know, some kind of this French, you know, kind of gallantry. And so that letter was very much dis debated everywhere. People were saying yes, no, and what do you think? I was, you know, asked what the idea think. I say, I refuse. I refuse to talk about that. I'm not interested. I don't care. If they want to be harassed in the parking, let them, you know. It's not, it's, I'm not interested. So it was also this, this contrast of uh, what matter, what matter. So the strike is, did not matter. And then for me, this strike of cleaning women, black and brown, and is for me the terrain upon which a real anti-racist decolonial feminist is. This is where you see it. Mm -hmm. This is where it's happening. Mm -hmm. Because it connects not just gender, race, and class, but also the fight against chemical industry, the fight against, you know, exhaustion, the fight against uh, sexual violence, which is absolutely pervasive in that industry. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, the fight again, the fact that it's a global thing, you know, it's a, globally, it's, it's not just in Europe, everywhere in the world, women are cleaning. Everywhere, even the poorest country, women will be cleaning offices and so on. So it was uh, also, also the fact that this strike was telling us something about where feminism, I mean, materialist, anti-racist, feminist should go and sh should be. Another aspect of your book and just your writing in general that I appreciate is the intersection of biography and, and really principled matter of thinking about um, anti-capitalism. And in several parts of this text, as well as other parts of your work, you gesture towards the legacy of, of communists and specifically leftists like Claudia Jones, um, who is also here in the UK, um, Ami Césaire as well, um, and you know even your history as someone who is uh, the descendant of someone who um, helped to start the Communist Party in La Réunion. Um, and I wanted to kind of gesture to to ask you know to what extent does that personal participation and historical connection to these leftist struggles in which people are thinking along class lines and along anti-colonial movements, not just as a kind of uh, re uh, rhetorical device, but also something you put into practice vis-a-vis uh, -vis organizing. How does that play a work, mm -hmm. a role in your writing mm -hmm. um, uh, today? Mm -hmm. Well, this, uh, there are many answers to that. Mm -hmm. um, one, of the, one of the answers is like, I want also to uh, take away anti-colonial communism from the European history about communism, mm -hmm. from, you know, like Moscow, the Gulag, whatever. No, there have been an anti-colonial communism that belonged to the global south, that belonged to black community in the north, mm -hmm. that has nothing to do, and that is, you know, like black Marxism, the radical tradition mm -hmm. of Cedric Robinson, Angela Davis, and Robin Kelly, and other, and Claudia Jones, and women also today. And I want to take that away from that, you know, historiography. I want to say, no, there has been something else that was deeply internationalist, deeply internationalist. I mean, at home, I remember newspapers were coming from all over the world. And so the world was not French to me. France was just something on the periphery. Mm -hmm. The world was a world of struggle, you know, the world of resistance everywhere. And in, in, so that was, and the fact that, of course, what I saw around me was people from, um, you know, from joining that party. So that party represented something. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to understand why, for instance, a woman who is uh, washing clothes or uh, 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 working in the sugar cane field or is a teacher or a man who is Muslim or the other is Hindu or Christian because you have all this in Catholic in Reno, would want to join that party. What was the dream they joined? What, was, what in communism talked to them? 
So I did not want to look from, you know, above, but I want to look at from really what people join. Mm -hmm. And they were, you know, their life was threatened, their job was threatened. They were risking, you know, to be beaten, to be sent in jail, and they join it. Mm -hmm. So there was, this is one I want also to recover that history of that uh, communism. And of course, for me, the, the legacy is one of deep internationalism, mm -hmm. really, um, the, the understanding that if, if people are free there, it helps us to be free here. And if we do the work of freedom here, it also will help other people there, mm -hmm. you know. So it's not the saving, you know, kind of humanitarian, you know, let's save people. It's no, it's you do the revolution when you, where you have to do the revolution. And this will help other revolution. And for women, the fact that, you know, my mother was a, a, a feminist and a communist, she, she took me everywhere where she went. And to see that also, to be with her, uh, with, along with women who were in that party and in a, a, a feminist organization of Reunion, was for me a, a very important political mm -hmm. education. I got my political education and my feminist education there. Mm. I did not get it by reading Simone de Beauvoir or whatever, you know, or going to school. I got it there, you know, by listening, by also being uh, very, you know, listening, listening, mm. just uh, listening. So that was very, it's very important for me and the, the question of uh, the courage <coughs> also. I think it's uh, quite often un underestimated how much courage it takes. But when I say courage, I'm not talking about some kind of a, a value above, every, you know, above everything. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the very strong, silent, but absolutely determined courage of this woman, mm -hmm. you know, to stand against racism, sexism, and capitalism, this and, and colonial. Uh, coloniality, as we say, you know, uh, even though it was the post-colonial place, but it was still a colonial mm -hmm. place. And full of, so that for me, it's, it's also if this, that that possibility of 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 creating of collective, of building a collective, and um, and finding their strength and hope mm -hmm. is for me very important. And that was that form of communism. And, and of course, for me, it was a, um, um, I have a aunt who was a, an important fighter of the, during the Algerian independence, mm -hmm. war of independence. So it's also, I mean, it's, it's, it's like being surrounded <laughs> by uh, people whose, um, uh, whose love and generosity gave me, you know, a lot of strength. Mm -hmm. So... In the same way that you described just now how um, there were communist and also leftist struggles that were outside of the European context, um, with, in, in my own reading and works around um, communist parties in Alabama, in Harlem, in Egypt as well, and, and Sudan and so forth, um, there is that internationalism that was important for breaking down um, colonial and anti-racist um, uh, walls, but uh, there's a, a similar parallel to that, the way in which we think about leftist struggles and who's considered to be a leftist, uh, as well as to feminist struggles. And in your writing, you try to kind of disentangle how we think about uh, uh, earlier versions of sem uh, feminism and more particularly civil civilizational feminism and how that gets used um, as a kind of colonial process in the current era insofar that um, that civilizational feminism can then be used and has been used um, to um, purport anti-Muslim rhetoric um, or full out racist and some cases um, fascist rhetoric. It relates a lot to Sarah Ferris's term femonationalism, at least within the European context. And I wonder, um, like, how do you see the history of these different feminisms that are often tied to the bourgeois, the upper class, um, operating and shifting? Um, and I think this question is really important in the context of the, the election of the latest uh, prime minister in Italy, um, Giorgia Meloni, and her association with the far-right party, and how we can think about challenging um, women in these positions of power who might then purport that their uh, nationalistic far-right parties are somehow feminist by virtue of having a woman um, elected into it. Well, as you know, Meloni was uh, congratulated by Hillary Clinton, so well, I mean, this is quite clear. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, two, I mean, two things. I mean, there is a historical 
trend, we can say, and something that really uh, ex accelerated by the late 1990s, mm -hmm. early 2000. The historical trend is that white feminism, whiteness was built, you know, also for women as something very in the in the art of slavery mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, and slave trade. So the white woman was born out of, in contrast to the black woman, mm -hmm. and she was fragile and, you know, and so the black woman had to do the work for her even, you know, to, to, to breathe to breath, uh, uh, to you know, feed, breastfeed her children, to wash her, to stay. And if she was giving birth, it was terrible, you know, like whereas the black woman could give birth in the corner of the field, you know. So that whiteness was very important. And then we have the narrative about uh, European feminists were anti-slavery. Mm. But anti-slavery does not mean that you are anti-racist. Mm. You know, anti-slavery is not automatically anti-racist. You can be against slavery, but you are not anti-racist. You know, so, so there was a moral condemnation of slavery, which was, you know, true, but it did not mean that this woman wanted equality, the equality and wanted to recognize black women as equal to them. And that, and the third thing that I always say, that effectively this woman, the European woman, had no right, you know, the civic right, and they did not have the right to vote. They did not have the right to be a surgeon, a lawyer, you know, uh, whatever. But they had to write to own human being. They, ha I mean, they had the right to have that private property. They have access to private property by owning human being. And that had nothing to do with the gender, but with their color, mm -hmm. the fact. Because as women, as gender, they did not have the other rights, right? They, they were. So when they do the, the connection, when some of the feminists like Obelham de Gouge or other, you know, do say, I am like a slave. No, of course, she does not have the same right like, a, like her brother, if she had a brother, she, but whatever. But she had that right. Mm -hmm. She had the right, she had the right. And that is absolutely very important to women and ourselves. Because then from then on, the access to private property gives us access also to capital. Mm -hmm. And we know that women had access by having slaves had capital. And we know that some of them, for instance, if they had received in, as in inheritance some slave, when they were married, they had their husbands sign a contract by saying that these enslaved people were there. That the husband will not have the right to sell them or to borrow money against them or to play, you know, to gamble, you know, on them. So they understood capital. They understood the capitalization of the black body. They absolutely understand that. They went to the slave market, they knew how to bargain, they knew. So they cannot claim innocence. They cannot claim, you know, they enter capital. Even though they were, you know, we were, they could enter capital. So that's very important to remember. And then, so let's move to the, in the 20, what struck me in the 1990s and 2000, and then Sarah uh, Faris uh, published Feminist Nationalism, but already by the 1990s, and we saw that, quite, especially in Europe, more than in the United States, it came to Europe, Islamophobia. The incredible obsession of feminists, you know, white feminists with the veil. You know, incredible. And they, they provided to the government the vocabulary of Islamophobia. It was the woman, the feminist, because they say that the veil is a sign of submission, the symbol of submission to, you know, patriarchy. So they used the vocabulary of women's rights to convince, you know, their men that Islamophobia was extremely important and veil women represented a threat to their right, you know, to the right that they have fought so much for to, to win. And they provided that the vocabulary, and the and they effectively women's right became a very important tool in the end of neoliberalism and imperialism. We know for Afghanistan, for instance, but we could also talk about Syria and Iraq and other places, or even the way a certain white feminists look at Iranian, uh, the, the Iranian women revolution today. Mm. So the, this, this, what I call civilizational feminism is when feminists understood that it could take the way in which the civilizing mission was worded, that in fact we are saving these people, you know, so we are saving the women from, you know, the, the structure that oppressed them. And Islam is by nature 
by nature, this is in their vocabulary, an oppressive religion. So they, were, they started to separate. Europe was by nature the terrain on which women's rights would emerge, equality between. And then it became one of the, uh, 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 something through which a country uh, could be assessed. How are women's rights in that country? Or, oh, you know, they are not respected. Bad country. Or, oh, this kind of good country. And what has been, you know, before assessed through education, you know, or else, whatever, how many children can go to school, or, you know, how many hospitals you have, became, in fact, judged through what are the women's rights. So you could applaud. And that what I what I say that the woman the, that white feminists started to detach women's rights mm. from some some nonetheless some form of radicalism, if it could be, and turn it to to a pity to offer that to imperialism mm. and neoliberalism. And remi remember that imperialism had lost a lot of argument at that time, right? Because you know what well, you you cannot say you go you not going to invade country just because you want to invade country. Women's rights gave them the justification to invade country. Who is you know who's going to be for you know girls of twelve you know twelve year old girl being married? Everyone says, oh no, that's terrible. You know, so women's rights was a very good uh, ideology. To, to, to provide, and the corporate world, world also, you know, and, uh, and in fact, having women at the head of corporation, and so it's, it's, it's even encouraged by some, some you, know, uh, in, you know, financial times, of that form of capitalism is absolutely okay to have politics of diversity mm -hmm. and inclusion and more women in the, in this, this. So we have to stop to see, you know, like what is being presented of this kind of abstract system. Mm -hmm. That was that come back and come back through that form of feminism. For me, the way in which that feminism is is providing to imperialism and to neoliberalism the argument that otherwise they will lack, show how uh, uh, you know dangerous it is. Mm -hmm. And then to go back to the election of fas of women at the head of fascist party. This also, I mean, women. As John, I mean, I don't see why women will not be fascist and, you know, like for the far right and totally racist. Mm -hmm. there, there, there was, I mean, they have, they have shown they supported lynching in the United States. They even invented, you know, accusation against black men, so the black men will be lynched. They, I mean, they have no, they, they, what we saw in Germany when they accused a migrant in corn, you know, of, of having a, and, and a rape woman during Christmas or New Year's Eve some six, seven years ago. Yeah. And it was a, you know, it was a lie. Mm. But it served, you know, women have like, no, so, so they are not, um, it's effectively that feminism has become, for me, an adversary. Mm. It's not just, oh, they are, they are wrong, or, you know, they could be, be brought back. Mm. No, they are, for me, adversaries. Mm. They are totally on the side of the people who exploit, who dispossess. They will agree they want to save the woman in Afghanistan, but they agree with the sanction today that send, you know, the population is, so, you know, they agree. Um, they agree with the occupation of Palestine mm -hmm. because of their Islamophobia. They, you know, it's, it's really, no, it's, it's really, so we have, uh, and I will not be surprised that more and more women will take the head uh, of a far right, uh, you know, a fascist party. We have one in France, we have one in Italy, and we see some of, a lot of them in the United States, you know, ready to take, you know, the leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there is something that uh, we have to think about and be uh, clear about it, you know, and, and do the analysis that we need. Mm -hmm. So I want to think about different versions of feminism, especially in light of uh, black feminists who have contributed uh, to the discourse and intellectual kind of thoughts around what feminisms can represent. And because I'm a historian, one particular um, black feminist and also abolitionist who has been quite pivotal in, in helping to expand uh, my thinking on this is Sojourner Truth, who her famous ain't I a woman speech and, and really um, challenging this idea or sense that um, woman as an identity was some fixed entity because clearly as someone who is 
for in her case, formerly enslaved and manumitted and fighting against um, uh, slavery could explicitly indicate what the contradictions were for a white American feminist who claimed to uh, be fighting for the suffragette movement and, um, and other issues. But fast forwarding even to uh, the 20th century, the what you know, my kind of political education ever very much included black feminists like Angela Davis, who you've cited extensively in your work, and um, as well as thinking actively about um, Claudia Jones, who I mentioned earlier, um, and the Combahee River Collective, who have experienced a revival in recent years, but not necessarily always, par primarily because of the, the intersections of being black uh, woman and in queer and Marxist, um, that was quite, uh, which is why they had to form that collective in order to find some community to articulate their class um, and anti racist and anti sexist demands. Um, nevertheless, uh, one thing that I've been kind of working through as a diasporic person, black person living in Europe and more specifically in, in Berlin, is to expand that corpus of literature beyond the black American or even black Caribbean experience, which I also read, um, to something else. And one, you know, we were recently in Venice for this loophole for retreat, where it was a black feminist gathering of what, 400, 500 people uh, who were thinking actively about art literature and pushing the lens of how we um, cite people like Harriet Jacobs, who was formerly enslaved or, and, and so forth. And what I was um, pleasant, like happy about, but wanted more of is people like Gail Lewis, who is there as a black British uh, feminist, um, but thinking it, about the, the contributions of Hazel Carby, um, as well as um, and another person who I haven't read enough about, but I wanted to get your thoughts on is Suzanne Cezanne and her uh, husband, Ami Cezanne, most a lot of people know about him because he was part of the negritude movement and very much involved in um, thinking and, and politicizing uh, of, of Afro-Black French movement in Matinique. And Suzanne Cezanne, being black and feminist and even a surrealist, like she was um, very um, eccentric, um, is incited as much as, as, as he is. And um, I kind of wanted to get your thoughts about what does it mean that the, the canon of black feminist literature often cites the same Anglophone people and at the expense, I would say, of people like Suzanne Cezanne or even some Afropean feminists who are also thinking, writing, and pushing our boundaries of how we think of these issues. Or black feminists from Africa. Or the African continent, yes. Who were well, totally forgotten, mm -hmm. even more forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's, I mean, it's, of course, this is very important to, um, to see the canon, but also to look at, uh, for instance, Cesar, uh, Suzanne Cesar did not leave as much writing as Aimé. So that's already, so you have to also to look at the absence mm -hmm. and not just big, so not the absence as lack, you know, she did not write so that bad, so what she said had less importance, mm -hmm. but on the contrary, what she, the little she say has a lot of importance. Mm -hmm. So you have also to reverse the way you look at it. And uh, you have also um, I, uh, this, I mean, this, the importance of bringing a black woman and, you know, other also women, brown women, I mean, women from also from the global south or from some part is a very important work. It's a very, very important work. Um, it's, it's also because, it, as you say, even among black families, some of them will be constantly quoted and other will be totally forgotten. Mm -hmm. Or suddenly a text would become again so fetishized. You know, this one going to be like every, in every book you have to have the Combahee River Collective. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, it's has something to do for me also with the um, perhaps with the with work. What is work? What 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 is writing? Mm -hmm. What is the work of writing? You know, uh, what is it? What is the work of writing? Do you write to a uh, drop name? Do you write to 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 prove to the to the academia that you know all these people, mm -hmm. uh, or do you write because you want to say, "Oh, I understood something, and I think it will be important to share," and I'm going to put, put the light on the very little things. I'm not going to, you know, but this will help, you know. And so it's also perhaps uh, 
we are pushed by academia or whatever to look for the big, you know, like for whatever. And what people will say which concern the little, not in terms of dimension, but in terms of what is seen as important and what is seen as little. And I think to, to push for the little, you know, to, to, and because this is where also black feminists are talking. And when I say, you know, the little, I, I, I repeat myself, is not literally in terms of importance. It's in terms of the, the loudest voice, the, the most important text, the text that's that going to be, of course, also given in the syllabus, you know, and that you, f you say, oh my God, I have to read it and I have to quote it, you know, right mm -hmm. away in the introduction. So, you know, it would be seen. So that's, that's effectively, it. I think we have, the, this question of, of quotation goes also with the kind of writing we have to develop. What is, you know, the kind of decolonial black feminist form of writing? Mm -hmm. that, that, that for me, it's not just the question of like, you know, enlarging what we, but also what we write, for whom we write, mm -hmm. and why are we writing? Are we writing to publish or are we writing because of, oh my God, if I don't say that thing, I mean, this is really something, I have a real desire to say something, and which means that I'm going to work, and it's going to be difficult, mm -hmm. as you know. And so that work is important. Mm -hmm. So I will say that the work of, of looking for Suzanne, uh, rather than constantly looking for Aimé, is also the way in which you will write. Mm -hmm. It's not just why not quoting Suzanne and quoting Aimé. It's like, what do you write for whom? And therefore, Suzanne will come, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, but, um, so, and paying attention, yes, uh, uh, we, we are, um, school teachers, um, to look for the, for the gallery of portrait, you know, that, oh my God, did I forgot one, you know, like, oh my God, I have to show that I have, you know, like all mm -hmm. of them, you know, so we are, uh, again, you know, um, a writing that is closer to, to, to at the same time to us, but also to what we want to engage with. You know. mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, th I think the, that question of why do we write is um, just as important as what language do we write in, and to what extent are we also using different media to communicate and articulate some of these ideas with that in a it doesn't just remain within an ivory tower or within a, an insular network. Um, and I think that that expanding our imagination, both as a as a feminist praxis of inclusion is, is something I think that um, many of us can, can work harder on. Like I, I mean, I'm including myself in that, in that, um, in that cam. Um, I kind of want to ask uh, a little bit about a very pressing issue that we're living in, which is uh, the climate crisis. And it comes up a little bit uh, in your, or somewhat in your work, but one of the things that I've, I've been, you know, very, um, you know, frustrated by in the context of this global, you know, phenomenon of the climate crisis is reading a statistic recently that said in, um, in the next decades, most of the people, women will be the people who are going to be the most displaced by the climate crisis. Um, and we've seen, at least in this year alone, um, record heat, uh, floods in Pakistan, hurricanes in Puerto Rico and the east and west coast of Florida, where I'm from the state of Florida. Usually I just say Miami because uh, Florida as a state is quite reactionary, but it is... Um, yeah, I'm working through um, how women or femmes and non-binary people who might be in very precarious situations for whatever reason and being subject to um, a kind of ecological disaster, but as well as ecological grief when the climate attacks and you're no longer can trust the, 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 the flora and fauna around you. Um, and just wondering um, to what extent or how do you work through and with a kind of uh, climate justice movement that's also embedded into a feminist praxis uh, on a global scale, because it's, it's one of the few issues at this point that's going to affect us all. Like you can't, you can't escape from it. Um, in this, um, and so how um, does a feminist international approach uh, to organizing um, also dovetail with a climate justice mm -hmm. movement as well? Mm -hmm. Well, um Capitalism, racial capitalism, is building an 
uninhabitable, inhabitable and irrespirable world, which means that a lot of us will die, you know, but not only human beings, everything that needs oxygen can die. And I was, uh, you know, uh, I'll write this, um, a piece like, you know, um, the right to breathe a universal, a revolutionary struggle. Because when I read the, you know, among the data as you, that you say that more people die every year of air pollution than of any other cause. And that children in the global south or in the black and brown minority or indigenous minority in the north or and in the south mm -hmm. are born with reduced lung. Mm -hmm. So making them more precarious to effectively disease and other problem and to premature death. Right, because you cannot breathe, you cannot breathe. You know, there is no, you know, there is no plan B. Right, mm -hmm. and that construction of the world in which even you know that you can breathe. So the I can breathe from effectively Eric Garner, George Floyd, police violence to the fact that I can breathe because racial capitalism with toxic fume, the war, the war. You know, all the imperialist war leave behind enormous pollution. You know, of the river, of the soil, of everything. So how do we, what will be, you know, the, effectively our struggle? I mean, what will be the anti-racist, feminist struggle to that? And the fact that effectively women are, more, are, are touched the most because effectively air is polluted, water is polluted, the two things that as human beings we need, mm. like to survive, you know, like really basic things. And how this target women and children. So how what we call disposable, disposability is becoming a politics. Mm. It's not just a consequence, it's a politics. It's absolutely the choice of a politics, right? It's really to fabricate prim, you know, premature death mm. by hundreds of, you know, it's not just small number. So we have to, to really confront that and confront the fact that this assault on, on life on the possibility of life, while uh, the, the billionaires are dreaming of going to Mars or, or, or already be building an enclave in which they will protect themselves, you know, through it. And then they will, you know, push people. And we see it. The war between Mexico and United States is not just about stopping migrant. It's already, you know, when you read some report of the Pentagon, they are already thinking of the climate refugee. Mm. That so you really have to protect North America from the climate refugee that America has produced, that North America has produced. Mm. So the question of, the, as, as you say, the climate crisis of the climate abyss in which that we are looking at and that mm. we raise really for me, it's really the struggle of the 21st century in terms mm. of class, race, gender, everything, you know, in terms of life, it's mm. really because it's no longer just exploitation mm. or dispossession, which has been the politics for centuries, is about suffocation mm -hmm. and exhaustion, you know, su you know, making life impossible. So it's not about just, you know, killing people uh, to make the land, to occupy the land, or to transport, to deport them so they became enslaved on a plantation. Mm -hmm. It's like, let's get ready, let, let's build for, so that a, little, a few can live a comfortable life. Mm -hmm. The fact that even here, you know, the way I often mm -hmm. say that to, to, and so we understand, the fact that we open the, the, you know, the tap and that there is water, mm -hmm. and that water can even be, drink, you mm -hmm. know, that we can even drink it, is exceptional is absolutely exceptional. Mm. And you, you know, from Haiti, you know that. I mean, the number of country now in you for, in, where you have to drink in plastic bottle, mm -hmm. which means that effectively encourage the, you know, industry of plastic and Nestle mm -hmm. and all these big corporations. And we know the, the, also the consequences with women, you know, feed, breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. So all this is every time that you, you look at something and you pull all the, you know, the, the thread, you see the, that construction, I mean, that creation of an uninhabitable world. Mm. So that for me, the fact that uh, 
uh, how imperialist world, so um, what is pollution and contamination today? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just the virus that escape, you know, that goes. Mm -hmm. It's about leaving behind, you know, um, we know that in Iraq, in the south of Iraq, children are born with leukemia mm -hmm. because of what the U.S. Army left behind. We know that, you know, entire land, rivers, are, are, that cannot be used any longer. In Martinique and Guadeloupe, it's the soil and river operated for generations because of a pesticide that was forbidden in France, but that the state allowed to protect the banana mm. plantation owner, who are the descendant of the slave owner. Mm. And who are, you know, the victim is the black co community of uh, Guadeloupe and Martinique. In the Pacific, the nuclear test done by the US, UK, France, has totally destroyed entire island and mm -hmm. people are born with cancer and children are born with cancer. So we have, for me, for instance, it's like, how do we look really that incredible assault, I mean, that monster, mm -hmm. you know, and we really see, and as I was uh, talking to us this morning and I see there is a meanness and a cruelty that we have to, uh, you know, like to, to say, yeah, this is really mean. It's not just, as I say, exploitation and dispossession. Mm -hmm. It's really letting people die of suffocation, being suffocating, you know, or the flood, or the mega fire, which produce also contaminated air. Mm -hmm. So there is, you know, there is a, a really something that we have to think about, mm -hmm. so that how do we imagine the post, you know, the post-racist, post-capitalist world. Mm. And to go back to your first question for me, how we will clean the century of wasted land and wasted lives that Russian capitalism has created? Mm. How we will repair the damage? The damage will not be repaired like that. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a long time because it had been deeply, deeply, deeply contaminated. That that economy of extraction meant from the beginning of slavery that you mine the gold here, there is no more gold, or you mine it there. And in the meantime, you know, people are dying in the mine and their, you know, their body will mix mm. with, the, with the land and become, you know, and then you move, and capital move, and capital move, and capital is moving today. Mm. Banana plantation, oil palm plantation, destroying lives and land and water. So that economy is really an economy that absolutely that is, is destroying and with the idea of techno-totalitarianism that mm -hmm. will save us. Mm -hmm. you know? So we have uh, in this idea of reparation and, um, and if cleaning damage, we have to work with entangled temporality. And that's the difficulty also, you know, uh, to answer your question, to continue. The fact that we still have to repair the past, mm -hmm. which is barely repaired that we have to repair the present as we are living the present because we see around us public services being destroyed, you know, because that's part mm -hmm. of the precarity you're talking about, the construction of precarity. And of course, the mega fire, the flood, the, you know, and we could even think of Katrina, mm -hmm. how, you know, black community were left to, to, to die in Katrina. So we see that climate crisis, the flood, the mega fire, the earthquake, it is compounded that these people, the drought in India or in pa the flood in Pakistan and so on, will, you know, that mm -hmm. this will, they will be left aside. So we have to, to do this and we have already to repair the future because Russian capitalism is building a futureless future. Mm -hmm. And we have to say, yes, there is a future. We have to reappropriate the, the notion of the future because we let them in their end, this is a futureless future. Mm. And so they build a form of dread also and a feeling of powerlessness. How are we going to get out of that, you know? Mm. And that we have to fight against. That for me, how do we fight? By that. Mm. There is against powerless, the feeling of powerlessness, again, the feeling of that, oh my God, it's too much. Uh, again, the seduction of techno-totalitarianism and, and really to fight again, along with indigenous community, black communities, against pollution and contamination. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the fight that they fight against the factory that's going to be built here, or the, the road, you know, like all this accumulation mm -hmm. of, of I can breathe, you know. So, uh, and the, the, 
one of the things also, I think, we have to exercise our imagination. Mm -hmm. We have to do exercise in imagination. We really have to. Because from school, from little school, we are, um, our curiosity is being, you know, constantly uh, challenged. You know, that when children say, why that, and why that, oh, please stop asking why, you know, like stay mm -hmm. quiet. Mm -hmm. And so you're taught not to ask why. Mm -hmm. Why is a first important question. Why is it like that? Why is it like that? Why is it like that? Why? Who built that? Why is it like that? You know, like mm -hmm. what? The world was, you know, the world around us is a social world. It was made by social forces, so we can change it, right? Mm -hmm. And, but that work of imagination, in fact, this is, I think, important point in this question. What is the, what is the world we want? Mm -hmm. What are the institutions we want to build? Mm -hmm. What are, you know, how, we, how do they look? We have to fight against what is now, and we have to also to fight to, so some of the social law that we have won are not being destroyed, but we have to build already, you know. And as you know, I work a lot about uh, slavery, and for me, the maroon, mm -hmm. the, the people who started rebellion, women and men, or, you know, who even refused to eat, uh, at abortion, whatever, it's because they say, no, this is not the world. This is not natural. Mm. There is no, even though that was supported by the church, by culture, by the economy, by the politics, by the, by, by the law, by everything, they say no. And they say, one day we will be free. Mm. And that one day we will be free will be, you know, at that horizon. So what is the, our horizon today for which effectively, and the climate crisis presenting really an incredible challenge. Mm. How do we fight against that? Where do we, where do we stand? Where, where do we find the weakness in the machine? And we throw those little stones so it kind of, you know, like stop the machine. Where, where is that? How do we connect also, as you say, I was struggle with other struggle. Mm. How do we see how uh, globalization, neoliberal globalization, connect me with a woman in Bangladesh mm. who is, you know, doing the T-shirt that, you know, I'm, I'm wearing or whatever and things like that. So how this connection that was put in place already by colonial slavery. Mm. And this is something that, that bear, you know, that is, is suffocating the world, mm. you know. So I have one final question that relates to a lot of the things that you just brought up, which is this question around imagination. And as you pointed out, um, there's something particular and special about the enslaved people in the Americas who refused to accept uh, the category that they were somehow objects by their enslavers. And from the time that they were abducted to the time that they were forced, the time that they were forced across the Atlantic Ocean, and in some cases, jumping off or committing suicide, to even on the plantation trying to burn it down, um, there were these active ways of imagining a new world, as you as you said. And one particular um, person who is often not cited but was part of the Haitian Revolution, which is very dear to me. Uh, because that's where my family emerged, is um, Cecil Fatima. And she um, was one of the enslaved uh, women uh, who was part of um, trying to create a maroon society and help to ignite uh, the revolution. Uh, mo most people know about Toussaint Louverture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Henri Christophe, and the others, but Cecil Fatima um, is often alighted from that history primarily because she was a woman. She, um, I don't think she have, she never learned how to, to read or write. And she, women, unfortunately, after the Republic was formed and severed their t ties from the, the French government, weren't necessarily put into positions of power. And so we can celebrate that it was the first black republic, um, Haiti that is, but um, we can't celebrate how they treated women um, in this uh, post-colonial context. And um, it nevertheless reminds me of the importance of uh, Robin D.G. Kelly's work, uh, Frida Dreams, which traces the history of like the black radical imagination, not from this place of, um, and we've spoken a lot about the reasons why we have to challenge capitalism, anti-black racism and so forth, but from this place in which people are getting together and, and dreaming and um, trying to under, understand and imagine new strategies for political formation. 
Um, and I think that part of what feels on the one hand um, a bit discouraging about this current moment is that people have been pushed to the edge <laughs> with respect to austerity, with respect to the time that they have available, um, political chaos, one minute you have a prime minister, the next minute you don't, um, and so forth, that it's, it's just not always clear, you know, how do you, like you said, people feel exhausted and they can't necessarily breathe from the news cycle that's, that's occurring. And, and I, I wonder to what extent um, do, you know, this imagination question, how, how do we get to that point when people have also been pushed to their limits? Mm -hmm. And what can we learn from these historical examples of, um, you know, slave rebellion or the civil rights movement or the uprisings here um, in Brixton and so forth as a kind of model and perhaps dress rehearsal for what is possible mm -hmm. in, in the future? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> in twenty in December twenty twenty one, when there was like thousands of refugees on the Poland Belarus border, and they were caught between the police or Belarus police and the Polish police, which were you know throwing you know cold water into them, I said to myself, okay, the zone of non-being that Fano described in the colony, that place where the people are created as you know not human, is coming to Europe. And here we have zone of non-being on Europe, right? And and we are, you know, and of and the European community supported the Polish, you know, government because again that hybrid war. So we saw people being, you know, like effectively in this like no zone, right? Mm -hmm. Freezing temperature, being caught and and being yet just you know pushed on both sides. Mm -hmm. That situation of uh, zone of non-being and the the incredible uh, brutal politics uh, against refugee in Europe, uh, on the border, but inside Europe also. You know, the fact that if you have camps, many, many camps in Europe. I mean, the word camp, you know, coming back, it's there, constantly, everywhere. There is not one country in Europe which does not have a camp, mm -hmm. has organized camp with barbed wires around and guard and everything. What is that? What is going on? So thinking of that and, you know, talking with refugee also, I started also to think, okay, what, beside, you know, you say the rebellion and so on, what has been needed, what was needed to organize? Mm -hmm. And I thought about refuge and sanctuaries. And of course, I thought about the Underground Railroad, but also the kind of refuge and sanctuary that were built during the War of Independence in Algeria, but also during the fascism in Portugal, or the fascism in, in Spain, or, uh, you know, the, all the anti-colonial war and the war of independence. Mm -hmm. The fact that they are a place where you will knock on the door and the door will open and you will find mm -hmm. refuge. In the world, effectively, of permanent, in the state of permanent war. Mm -hmm. Because what I see today for me is a state of permanent war. Mm -hmm. It's soft sometimes and so on, and it can be very, and it depends, of course, who is targeted. But you know, they will target everyone at one point. You have uh, in, in Italy and in France, I don't know for the UK, but people who help refugees are criminalized mm -hmm. today. They are criminalized, they can, you know, they can be sent to jail mm -hmm. because they have helped refugee by, you know, driving them to the hospital, for instance. There was a, a case like that in France, or giving them water, or mm -hmm. uh, letting them, you know, charge their phone in their mm -hmm. apartment. So that's part now of complicity with smuggling. Mm -hmm. So this is where we are, right? This is where we are, criminalizing solidarity, criminalizing giving refuge and sanctuary, criminalizing even giving a glass of water to someone, which is like the first you know, human gesture that you do. So how do we re build refuge and sanctuary? Because effectively, there have always been refuge and sanctuary. Mm -hmm. It could have been a bookstore, you know, a black woman bookstore. It could have been a clinic, a woman clinic. It could have been a clinic for kids, you know, transgender kids or gay kids. It could have been also a sanctuary. So the difference I made perhaps between refuge and sanctuary, but I'll say it's not a very, you know, rigid one. A refuge, I will see them are more temporary, mm -hmm. uh, answering to the urgency. And sanctuary could be something that effectively you could spend at least three months there for mm -hmm. us. Because we need to rest. Mm -hmm. We need a space where we rest. Mm -hmm. Because as you say, people are pushed to stress. And the rest has to be a place, not just in which we're gonna organize necessarily, 
but in which you can sleep. Mm. Refugees tell you that they never sleep soundly mm. on their way because they are constantly on the run, they are constantly afraid of being attacked or being fined by the police. And they talk about the fact that the, day, the night, I mean, the, the day when they find a place where they feel safe mm -hmm. and they can take a shower and go into bed with clean sheet mm -hmm. is for them an incredible. The body, the body suddenly is something else. And we have to understand that. The right to rest is the right we have to fight for. It's a place also where you can find food, where you can find love, where you can find, you know, like, you know, like effectively a human space. It can be, as I say, a bookstore, a collective, a clinic, but it can also be underground. And I think we have to think about underground place. Not underground, I mean, perhaps one day it will be really underground, but already, you know, we don't have to say everything we do. Mm. We have to lie, we have to hide the things that we do. We cannot say everything. You know, we, we cannot trust you know, these this people, you know, and tell them, oh, we are, we are preparing that. No, we have to prepare. And, and we have, if we are looking, as you say, you know, whether, you know, enslaved in Jamaica, in, in, in the state or in Cuba or in, uh, everywhere they were, they did not say everything. Mm -hmm. They had, you know, they, and the, what started the Haitian revolution was in the forest, right? in the dark of the night. Mm. So this is, when I say refuge and sanctuary, we have to think, refuge and sanctuary, you could find fake papers, you could print it, the, news, the you know, newspaper that, was, that would be circulated, you had ideas. We have to have this, this space, more and more. Um, because the war that is being waged against uh, black and brown community and more and more people even, you know, and more and more white people also will not stop. Mm. And so we have to prepare, I mean, if you were at Le Full of Richard Venice, and I don't know if you remember Lorraine O'Grady saying, we mm. have to prepare for war. Mm. There is a war and we have, and I absolutely agree with her. Mm. I absolutely, I think we are in a state, but in, not in the war that is being in Ukraine right now, or was in Iraq, or is still in Iraq and Afghanistan still, the war has not stopped. But uh, um, yes, there was a war. There was a war, and, um, and as you were saying, also fascism is rising in Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, I mean the, the French president met with the prime minister of Italy and they chatted for one hour because they get along very well. So the, we are not protected. We are not, I mean, we are still more or less safe, mm. depending on our position, social, gender, valid, you know, position in, in, in society. But we are not safe, mm. fully safe. Though those who are safe are just like a little tiny group of people, mm. uh, but no, no one is safe. They are not, they, I mean, we are to remember that uh, the, the powerful have no no hesitation, no hesitation to kill, to maim, to torture, to send into exile, none. History have taught us that, but history have taught us also how to fight back. Mm. And this is what, so imagination, uh, love, I mean, loving each other, solidarity, building collective, uh, finding time also to, when you, you say, what should we do? It's also to be with friends, to dance, to have a party sometime, because you know, it's gonna be, you know, we have to also, uh, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, we have to build autonomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that, this all space of autonomy. Mm -hmm. And they can be here. Mm -hmm. They cannot be, you know, it's here also. Mm -hmm. And this, they cannot take it yet. <laughs> all right. Hi, uh, it's been an honor to listen to you. I'm a big fan of you, so I, <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to hear you. And I have 10,000 comments, but I just leave it to one question, really. And it's how this discussion around love, solidarity, uh, and imagination, really, has to do with a very short piece in the book, but I think that is central, I'm very interested in is how are you thinking uh, on this idea of critical decolonial pedagogy? And what is the role of pedagogy 
and in terms of what can we do for these spaces that are also very elite spaces. So I wonder if you can expand on that. Okay. I think we'll take another question from the other side. Yeah, we can take three. Hello, uh, I'm a first... Hello. Yes. Uh, uh, so thank you for your talk. I'm a first year PhD student and I would like to study the track movement of the Hibis Hotel Cleaners. Of you have to speak closer because oh. I can't. To the, can, can you yeah. hear better? Yeah, oh, yeah. it's better. Thank also you. Better. Uh, hi, so I'm a first year PhD student and I would like to study the track movement of the Ibis Hotel Cleaners of Batignol. I think you know it. What? Sure. You want to know more about the cleaners, you said? Or? Yeah, the oh, track ah. movement oh, yeah. of cleaners of the Ibis Hotel in Paris. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know how to actually make my work decolonial. For example, you mentioned um, that we should ask ourselves who are we writing for and how do I conform to academia while also at the same time trying to make hmm. be the colonial. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, thank and you. One more here. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. It's a little bit following on from the first question. Actually, it's a little bit following on from the first question. But before I say that, um, just thank you for also referencing the role of African women within the black feminist movement because there are so many small networks that are taking place across the continent that are doing amazing thing and they're not on the, the big platforms uh, that you have over in the West. Uh, so just uh, making that little comment. Um, but going back to that, to that first question, I'd heard another talk um, that you were in and you use lots of verbs, lots of doing words. And there was an end of one talk where you said that in terms of the decolonial feminist movement what we need to do is to I think it was to, to 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 speak to breathe to sing something like that and I loved that they were all doing words and you've spoken a lot about the act of breathing um, and rest and exhaustion um, and speaking but I'm curious about the role of song uh, as as part of the decolonial, decolonial feminist movement and I suppose what that means in terms of um, how we can speculate our futures uh, around this oh. around this movement oh. thank you <clears throat> thank you okay we will start from the last one yeah I think song you, I remember uh, for me there was no revolution without song there is no protest that what we saw in Egypt in Algeria in Lebanon and wherever or in 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 the United States or without song and if you connect it with breathing you know how we say that the atmosphere, the political atmosphere, is irrespirable, right? And and then suddenly thinking, you need to breathe, right? You need that, to, you know, other, you know, you know, to expand and so on. So that the breathing and the singing become effectively a revolutionary act and movement. And so I do, uh, and and if, uh, and for the the feminists, you know, like singing, uh, and that as a circulation of future. I do think for I, I remember uh, a conversation years ago in France about you know a circulation of a story about uh, slavery, and it was like blah blah blah, and read this book and read that book, and I just say okay, Bob Marley Redemption Song did much more than any book, any book for kids to learn about, you know, colonial slavery. So that song, but we can think about other songs, of course. Mm -hmm. That effectively is very important, I think, for me. Uh, songs and poetry, you know, that the circulation through this word, but for singing, I will also say the strength of the human voice to as a circulation that sometimes you don't understand the language in which that song is being sung, but you understand what is being said. You understand it's a call for freedom, it's a call for solidarity, or it's a call for love. And that, effectively, it's a language that transcends the question of translation. And song are absolutely, uh, um, effectively bring emotion, anger, a sorrow, mourning, very well, you know. And, f and this is, I, I think, because why everywhere, there is no culture where people have not, are not singing. And uh, singing is also what you do to a child, you know, to, when, you know, to, to put a child to sleep, or to, it's also what you do to a, very, to an elderly person who is, you know, like at 
the moment that it needs also some some care. So um, singing carry that uh, human, you know, connection. That sometimes uh, speaking does not as as well, you know, because speaking kind of uh, you you listen in another way. You're, you're because you want to understand the meaning and perhaps to answer. Singing, it's not that. It's singing. It's talking to you here. You know. Um, the cleaners of uh, Ibis Batignol and how do you write effectively uh, for and with them and not with academia? And academia will not uh, receive it, of course. Academia will not receive it. And that's the problem we have to deal with. Academia will demand that you, you know, that effectively, that you know all the literature about this and that. And will allow, for instance, the voice of Ibi, the woman of Ibis Batignol as witnesses, you know, like, okay, the testimonies. You know, they are testimonies, so you can quote them as testimony, but not as theory. They, they are not saying, they are not speaking theory, they are speaking about their lives, and they are bringing testimony. So we have to be careful also about ourselves, how we say we are bringing testimonies. No, this is theory. This is theory about work. This is theory about the way in which, you know, that work. They absolutely understand the fact that they are black, that they are women, they are workers, and they are doing that jobs of cleaning. And they are proud of it. They are proud of the work they do. So here, there is something about a theory. Right? It's not about a testimony. They are telling you something about how cleaning can bring you pride and dignity. And they bring pride and dignity to the society by cleaning. Because otherwise that society will not be, will not have dignity. And that effectively, so how do you translate it in, <laughs> to, in academia? Well, I agree with you, it's not going to be easy. <laughs> so I will say, if you want to have your PhD, Let's say you do like two writing. You do the writing, you know, for the jury, and you know, and um, sometimes they tell, and you say yes, yes, yes. Oh, that's oh, that was so. Oh, thank you, professor. That was so smart. And then you do your stuff. You do your stuff that you will ca You know that you you will work with them afterwards, uh, because. The fact of nonetheless getting a PhD also can help us, can help in that work for, for those of us who, who, who work for a PhD. It's important that we are, there are more and more of us getting PhD. But then the PhD for it, it then to, to serve something, not just to have, you know, to get promotion, although it's good to get promotion also because. <laughs> Mean, but let's let's start. As I say, you know, we should be careful about. Yeah, uh, the point is also academia is more and more uh, abstract and asking for more about theory and not mm -hmm. about what is practice, and practice and the fact that the, the separation between theory and practice, which is you know a question as old as the world, and the separation with that and the fact of privatization also in academia, and the connection with uh, between academia and and the business world, you know, that, that what you do has to be useful to serve for policies. And how do we think about policies? And, um, and the fact that we cannot just say no to policies also, because sometimes policies bring some progress. So it, in fact, is to live w within the contradiction. Whereas the world of academia, you know, there is a world that wants you not to live with the contradiction. To, 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 to get rid of the contradiction, you, we, I think a decolonial you know, world is to live within the contradiction, you know, and, and to work through it. And it's not always, it's not only always easy, but sometimes we're gonna make mistake, but that's okay. That's, you know, that's okay. If we understand why we made the mistake and what was the mistake about, it's, it's part of, you know, the struggle, it's part of life. And uh, so that's, and the last, what decolonial pedagogy, that's a very important question. Uh, I was not the best, uh, uh, school was not something, I, you know, school in Réunion was like so French that I couldn't stand it, you know. 
I mean, I always say, you know, that for instance, you know, we learn about all the volcanoes in France. All of them are dead, right? Mm -hmm. We have a volcano in Réunion Island, which very nicely every year gets, you know, like uh, is alive. So instead of taking us to the volcano and have like, you know, a natural history lesson, we had to learn about all those, you know, volcanoes in France who shot us. So that school is about, is about really, as I say, crushing curiosity. School teach you to stay, to stay like that, quietly. Don't fight like that, right? Don't speak to, you know? <laughs> so it kind of, it teach you to discipline your mind and your body. And so it's a pedagogy of discipline. And so decolonial pedagogy is already, uh, for me, it's a pedagogy that allow for uh, curiosity, constant curiosity, uh, to understand, you know, as I say, um, how a banal object, you know, uh, we can learn from. And I gave an example, the example of the banana in, in, the, in the book, which, is, which was very important because I remember I had to do a workshop in a South Africa in a place and I say, okay, I want, you know, I'm not, don't want to talk about blah, blah, blah. So I say, I'm gonna start with banana, which is very like, everyone knows the banana. And from here, you know, the connection with slavery, the connection with pesticide, the connection with uh, imperialist intervention in Central America and the Banana Republic, the, you know, the connection with CIA, the connection with Monsanto, the connection with banana plantation, sexual violence, pest, you know, all this. The fact that the banana plantation are the most silent plantation in the world. So much pesticide that there is no little thing like that, there is no insect. So. For me, it, this pedagogy is that, and that nothing is natural in the sense of, you know, the, the earth around the, the sun. So this is that, and working collectively. In the workshop I do, and that uh, we, we are, you know, uh, talk about at the beginning, it's, it's really, it's, it's to bring together 20, 25 artists and activists uh, uh, of color, and sometimes some scholar, not too many scholars, because they tend to transform the workshop into a seminar, <laughs> you know? And it's not a seminar, it's okay. We have a question, and we have to do a public performance. And so I will give you an, so that's also decolonial pedagogy. I will give you like, more, uh, be more concrete because otherwise. So one, once was about um, water, war and peace. And it was about the water as, as a, you know, bringing war between people, but also the water of being very fragile, vulnerable, you know, and the, what was peace? What is peace today? And how do we think about peace? So it's not just that very short moment between two war, but what would be a revolutionary peace? What is peace? What is peacefulness? You know, peace has been left to the military or to the, and, but peace has always been a demand for revolutionaries and black feminists and revolutionary feminists. So we have to bring it back. But the point was like, so we, we came together and it was, the pedagogy is like, it has to be totally collective work, has to be very, not, not uh, how can I say, the lowest economy. So we don't start by saying, oh, if we had that, we will do that, or oh, if we had that. No, we don't. We have what we have and it's already a lot. So that's also to have to to be aware of what we have. So, for instance, you know, I can start by saying, okay, we are 25 here. What are all the language we know? What are the memory we know? What do we know to do? You know, for instance, I did a workshop about repair and say, what do we know about repairing with our hand? Not just talk about the seminar about reparation. What do we know? What will we be able to repair? Well, at the end, I can tell you, we will not be able to build the roof, which was very problematic. Uh, we, I mean, 95% uh, knew how to repair a bike. So I said, okay, we can open a bike shop, but you know, in terms of like uh, being uh, able to have a roof, we did not have. But that show how repair was more a topic for abstraction, uh, not abstraction, because in, but not even you know, the material necessity of repairing. So that's the colonial pedagogy to have, to get, to become conscious of that we speak about, but we don't know what to, how to do what we speak about. So being a little humble 
and also to do with what, to understand to um, be uh, yeah be, be conscious of our strength of what we have and from what we have to learn about you know what we don't have and to bring that uh, so it's not you know the the, the into, we have a, with many artists it's not the photographer and the co and the dancer and the musician is how we're going to bring our different capacity and talent together to produce something that is collective so curiosity uh, imagination love you know laughing also a lot and um, and that the, the question of the consciousness of our strength against fighting against the uh, the feeling of powerlessness or the, or the philosophy of lack right, that has been so important in, uh, you know, in development policy, in, uh, you know, underdevelop, develop, I mean, all this vocabulary and lacking this and lacking that, it wishes also, you know, the colonial vocabulary. So how do we get rid of that lack? And we talk about what we don't know, because of course we don't know everything, but it's not a lack. It's not because I don't know how the, you know, like, I don't know, quantum theory that I'm, you know, lacking something. I, 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 what, I, what I need is like to explain to me, although I'm not sure I will understand. But, you know, I accept also that some people know things that I don't know. You know, uh, and that's also part of the, how do we put our strengths together? Um, okay, we have one or oh, two. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm emotionally spent in the best way possible. Um, so thank you so much for We're thinking with us tonight. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. No problem. Um, I'm going to try to articulate this question, but forgive me, it might be a bit blurry. Um, I'm, I'm working, I'm doing my PhD on kind of chasing anti-colonial desire through the revolutions, particularly known as the Arab Spring and kind of their afterlives. Um, and something you said really struck me and got me thinking. When you said um, the, the example about the women being anti-slavery but not anti-racist, got me thinking about um, dissenting without being anti-colonial. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know, I mean, mm -hmm. It's almost like I don't have a question, but more a stream of thought. Um, basically, I'm thinking a lot about the failures of the post-colonial state as well, and the kinds of angers, collective angers, that have emerged through these kind of contemporary protest movements and revolutions. Um, and, you know, how do we think of anti-colonial sentiment in a way that's responsible, because sometimes there are forms of dissent that may not necessarily, or sh maybe shouldn't be read as anti-colonial, but I'm, it's just something I'm thinking through. I'd love to hear your Okay, thoughts. just before we go, to, what you mean is like dissent? Um, revolt, yeah. A revolt, or not necessarily anti-colonial? This is... Oh, I, yeah, so forms of revolt and protest that don't necessarily translate um, into a broader mm. anti-colonial... Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you. Okay. We have for where to? Um, hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for a really thought-provoking uh, and stimulating uh, talk or conversation. Um, so basically, I'm doing a PhD at SOAS, uh, and I'm first year, uh, and I'm looking at uh, the issue of violence and development and environmental racism in Colombia. Uh, and the resistance strategies of Afro-Colombian women. So I'm quite interested in this idea of um, moving away from the canon and looking at other feminisms that are being constructed across the diaspora. Um, but that's not my question. So uh, my question is actually, it's a bit of a downer, 
um, but I need to ask it because it's like a burning issue for me at the moment. And it's basically to do with how do we counter the march of black conservatism mm. and complicity mm -hmm. with the white supremacist system? Um, so at the moment, you know, we've got one of the most uh, diverse governments in this country. And we have women of colour who are colluding with white supremacy to oppress um, and, and kill and maim uh, other women of colour, children and men of colour. Um, and then in the US, we have, you know, we have Kemi Badenoch, Suella Braverman, Priti Patel. Mm. In the US, we have Candice Owens. Um, and then, you know, amongst the men, Kanye West. Like, the, the list, it just goes on and on. There are people in Congress who are countering uh, black activists who are calling for reparations, but black people who are saying that reparations are not the key. And this is a trend throughout history that has continued to present itself as an obstacle to black liberation and to decolonization. So you talked about imagination. Um, and for me, at this point, I'm stumped on what are the strategies that can be adopted to stop this? Mm. How can we either get them back into the fold or how can we, mm. how can we counter them? Mm. Because they're aligned to white supremacy, so mm. they're given artificial amplification on white supremacist capitalist media platforms, mm. which then gives them validation mm. while at the same time damaging the majority of the voices, mm -hmm. the disempowered people who do not um, you know, who do not agree and who definitely this is not reflective of their experience, oh. but they keep giving ammunition to the system. Uh -huh. So what can we do to stop this? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Hi, thank you for the conversation. Uh, I'm also doing a PhD, um, but I'm also working as a women's officer in a union here. Uh, that helps especially Latin American migrants who work as cleaners in different universities in London. And my question is about making alliances because most of the women who come from Latin America are, as they call themselves, invisible. Nobody sees them, uh, not even the academics at university. And within the union, that's also an issue. And as, an, as a union, it's it's complicated for me because, you know, we associate union as a very kind of democratic, leftist, whatever, favoring or helping women in a way, but they're not doing anything. So what could it mean to make an alliance um, or if we'd rather be accomplices? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Your first question. Um, well, anger is um, anger is um, can be a political sentiment, but you can be also burned and eaten by your anger. Um, to transform anger into a political action to something uh, has to be collective, and because anger is also very individual you know, in, in, in the sense, you know, or for instance, the collective anger. Um, you have also to understand uh, what triggers that anger and what is the target of that anger. So for instance, in, when in South Africa, you got South African attacking African migrant, black South African attacking black migrant as anger, because they see them as taking their jobs or whatever. It's uh, how you're going to transform that is by effectively the pedagogical, the political pedagogy of taking, telling them that it's the government and global capitalism which is responsible and not these poor people. Because the easiest way to be angry is to be angry as the person who is below you. There is always someone below you, you know. And so what we are taught, I mean, what is easier than to to, to effectively turn against the most dangerous enemy, because that enemy 
will effectively, as I say, kill you, maim you, torture you, is to turn to the weakest, again the weakest, and to get your anger out. So that is a div divide, you know, like a, the very old uh, policy, politics of, of power. And so this is where you have to fight, you know, like to, uh, but this is long and need to be built. It's not spontaneous. Uh, if you are uh, absolutely in incredible deprivation and you just see someone who does not have much, but it, you, as nonetheless that, why does he have that? You know, and so you don't look at those who live in the bourgeois neighborhood and you know drive around in SUV. You look at that person, and then the politician will manipulate that this other one, and the, you know, and then the rumor. You know, how do we fight against also these people are dangerous? You know, they, or what we see in India with you know uh, right now with a totally fascist Islamophobic uh, politics of Modi and the total craziness about, you know, what the Muslim are doing, you know, like raping into women so you're going to have a Muslim population. So this is what we have to fight against and understanding why today, uh, whether, uh, as, you know, one of you say, you know, about uh, U.S. and so on, what is, why today? Um, that kind of anger, that kind of fascistic anger is really all over the world. What's happening? What, what does it say? Because that happened before, you know, has happened before. You know, the, you, we can say about the pogrom, you know, like in, in the Europe against the Jews, or we can say also people burning entire black neighborhood in the US, or the attack in Brazil, or in Colombia, or whatever. So, you know, we know there is a story of that. So that the point is like to work that. And it's, it's again, it's again, we are working urban forces that have, that have um, a lot of tools media, social network, TV, whatever, you know, all these things. And we have really, it's, it's, uh, it's much more easy to, um, to diffuse lies and, and, you know, like, than to talk about who is uh, responsible for that. And also because um, sometimes the enemy look abstract, but that's far away. This person is just beside me. You know, and so I need to attack. You know, and so this is this is a long work of our of political organization. It's a long work, it's a long work, but it's long. It's difficult, but you know, you you do it, you do it because at one point people will you know uh, organize collectively. Um, then, uh, but sorry. Yeah, it's very important thing. What do we do? How do we do to stop, you know, these people who validate uh, uh, and, and support white supremacy? And when we see the, the two last ministers of interior here, two, you know, brown women, one madder than the other, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, the meanness, the incredible meanness, the incredible meanness is like they open their mouth to say cruel things, mm -hmm. you know? And that, for instance, for me, how do we address also that form of cruelty? You know, for instance, I was saying, at the border with Mexico, it's not just enough to put the family in jail. The, you know, the U.S. force has to separate the children, two-year-old children, from their family. What's the point? What is going on? You know, it's like absolutely the meanness. So why these brown people and black people are turning so mean? You know, the Clarence Thomas of the world and all these people, you know, like effectively. What is that? So we could say the effective, I mean, we could uh, follow Fano and say, you know, it's a black skin white mask. They want to have a little. Uh, they are caught into the politics of respectability and respectability mean for them to absolutely separate themselves from the community they come from. We are not like these people, okay? Mm -hmm. We went to Oxford, to Eton, you know, we speak like, we speak posh, right? And we, you know, and we are not like that, right? We don't eat, you know, we don't go to Magdo, we are not fat, we are very thin, we run every day, you know, all these things, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so that's part of it, and I, I think effectively the, um, the situation has changed in, in recent years because we do see um, elite, wealthy elite from the global south, much more assertive than before. We see them entering business, entering you know, art, entering culture, much more than before. And what is uh, 
what is difficult for us is like quite often in the global south, this wealthy elite have a certain, uh, um, they are anti-West, you know, there is anti-West things in them. So, and they manipulate the anti-colonial, you know, or de decolonization vocabulary to assert their power. So we are confronted with people who speak like, for instance, like Nkrumah, but they are just a bunch of you know, fascists, right? Mm -hmm. And so we say, oh my God, you know, but that's the, so if I, you're right, because what is going on is, uh, as I say, um, the struggle is, 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 is much more uh, open than before, you know, because of this wealthy elite, because also uh, it's no longer the free world, again, the non-free world, I mean, quote unquote, free world, right? There is effectively a much more multipolar world. Mm -hmm. And the elite, the elite from the global south are now coming to the north and getting their revenge, <laughs> right? But in, in a revenge in a fascistic way, not in a decolonial way. Mm -hmm. So we have to bring against class in our analysis, there is effectively a possibility today of a much more reactivating a global alliance of the oppressed, you know, because the wealthy elite are absolutely where they are. It's in Colombia, Brazil, Brazil, or, or even South Africa of incredibly corrupted wealthy elite. Incredible. And um, so uh, we cannot say, we. It's not the betrayal of decolonization. It's the fact that the, the, the attraction of money and power and domination was stronger than the dream of decolonization for them. That does not mean that the dream of decolonization has been abandoned. So what do we do for, to stop that? We show them for whom they are. And so when we are told, oh yeah, but you should be happy, you got like, you know, like a black woman or whatever. No, no, we, are, we don't fall for that. We are with the women, as you say, the Afro-Colombian women who are fighting, you know, against, you know, some uh, U.S. corporation that or against uh, the powerful elite, wealthy elite of Colombia who want to take their land and transform them into some stupid resort. So we really have to bring, again, class in its deep connection with, with race. So race is not, you know, the... the, the because the black person or the brown person, we have to bring back, you know, class interest. You know, those who are, I mean, on top of the, the new uh, prime minister is totally wealthy, right? And suddenly, and, and he has to do like he's Hindu, so he has to light the little candle for Diwali, and we should be like, totally like, oh my God, that's so beautiful, doing this on <laughs> that's Do it, do it. This, you know, we should not fall for these things. Mm -hmm. We should fall for the women who fight, you know, like effectively in the most, uh, we should fall for the prisoner who tried, you know, to, to, to learn to read and to get books and to learn, you know, and to fight against prison. And of course, so it's, it's very, of course now we are, the, all the media, all this fantastic, you know, to have this guy, but this guy we know is gonna enforce politics that will make the people here much more precarious and much more vulnerable. So we have again to show how it works. And in fact, you know, the fact that that person is brown, woman, or, uh, and, and it does not matter. That, the, what matter is what is your politics? What are your politics? Do you stand in, you know, be with the oppressed? Do you stand for progress? I mean, social progress, not the techno progress. Where do you stand? Otherwise, you're not my friend. Of course, we still, we still want them not to be like that. We would want them to be not like that. We would want them not to like bore like that in front of the white, you know, supremacy. We would want them like to be like, please stand up, like, stay straight, you know, like it's some dignity, please. <laughs> so of course, it's there is a form of humiliation. I agree. You know, I agree. It's but we have to get rid of that identification that we have, you know, that effectively the Prime Minister of Italy is a woman uh, and, you know, it's like, and she's young mm -hmm. and she's in a world of macho, like macho, like macho, 10 times macho, but we should not fall for her, you know. 
And because, and then if she complains that they are not sweet to her, we say, girl, you did not have to be with this bunch of fascists, right? <laughs> Okay, uh, how do you, um, yeah, the union, of course, the union are male-dominated. Mm -hmm. I mean, even, you know, for one, uh, the cleaning, cleaning in France, I mean, so the, all the women, was um, a subcategory within the, uh, uh, how do you call the people who work in the port? You know, the, not the sailors, but the guy who... The port workers? Or? Yeah, the port workers. They have a name? The people... Doctors. Yes. Doctors, yeah. yeah okay. So there was some, what this got to do with everything, right? So you got like big men, you know, that were used to carry things around the port and going down, you know, the ship. They were the one above this. So really, like, a, you know, an understanding. So yes, we have to fight against uh, sexism in the union. We have to, and again, as I say, the the fact of um, showing cleaning as the work without which there is no society. Yeah. As the indispensable work. That is, you know, there is no even a surgeon who can do surgery if the, the place is not clean. So we have to, and we have to fight within the union. And of course, this question of invisibility is very important because it's invisible, but not totally, because it's indispensable. So it's indispensable, but it has to be invisible, because nobody wants to think that someone has clean. We want also to that the cleaning is almost as come like that during the night. There were little Luton, you know, who came and cleaned the things, like, you know, like in Disney movie. And then we arrive and it's clean, you know. So no, body, people have come. So I think it's, it's a question of also developing that theory about the work of cleaning. Take it out of the domesticity, of the very important, the ideology of domesticity is very strong around cleaning. So the separation of cleaning from domesticity and entering it as really social work, right? And not just reproductive, be careful also about that, because um, there is a way in which reproductive will be connected with women, with femininity, right? In a way that will then perhaps lead to protection and not to justice. What is cleaning? And just to finish, because cleaning, we we'll have to imagine also in the world we want, how we will organize the cleaning. But the cleaning will still be needed. So what will be the cleaning in the post-racist, indigenous, black, feminist world. Who will do it and how we'll do it. So that, we enter it in a way that, you know, not connected with this tradition of looking at work, which is a tradition of European Union. We look at it from a feminist, black, feminist, indigenous, you know, brown feminist point of view, and we rework, I mean, we re the theorize what is this work. And, but it's, it's demand and effort because we are so caught with the vocabulary that has, that has framed and theorized cleaning from white feminism or union. And we have really that has to be our task. Thank you so much, um, Edna and Pascal.